Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Tuesday comic review show. I'm Jason. I'm Andy. And we're with Infinity Flux Comics out of Chattanooga, Tennessee. So as with every Tuesday, after we're done the bagging and boarding and sorting, we sit down with some of the hottest comics. Mm -hmm. We divide them up. I grab the ones I want. Andy grabs the one he wants. Mm -hmm. We fight over a few of them. We read them, and then we do this show where we tell you about the comics without spoiling everything. Mm -hmm. So we'll let you know if there's a first appearance, uh, you know, major death, something that makes it extra collectible. Mm -hmm. But past that, we'll just kind of tell you what we thought of the comic, who we think would like it. Yeah. Just a, a little rundown without taking the fun out of reading it. So uh, away we go. Away we go with a book I've been very excited about coming out. This is Geiger number one from Jeff Johns and uh, Gary Frank. So the creative team behind Doomsday Clock. They did Superman Secret Origin. They did, I believe they both also did Superman Legion of Three Worlds or Final Crisis Legion of Three Worlds. This team has worked together for a really long yeah. time. Yeah, they're familiar um, with each other. And you can tell, oh, they also did uh, Batman Earth One, which uh, is getting volume That's three soon, but because uh, this reminded me a little bit of that. Um, this uh, is about a, uh, a guy who... Um, at the kind of moment of nuclear war, um, throws his family in a bunker to save them. Right. Uh, but he does not manage to get inside. Then we jump 20 years, and uh, he may still be around, and in no longer in need of a uh, of a biohazard suit. Yeah, they're, they're telling legends about him at this point. Yeah, at this point he's, he's the got he's the boogeyman. Yeah, he's got all these names. They say, oh yeah, you can see glowing in the distance like a little nightlight or whatever they they really build up this like mythos around this guy where i think even one point somebody's like you're not even 10 feet tall like all the rumors are like he's this giant monstrous man um but he definitely he would fit in in a uh, a justice league or avengers too with his uh new abilities which i mean you'll see on the variant covers everyone's seen he's got this like glowing radiated um skull and everything so this i i wrote a bunch of notes and then i scratched a lot of them out because i'm like it's just me redundantly saying like i really like this <laughs> this was great but it really is um the art is top notch there's some really cool scenes that are very reminiscent like i was saying of batman earth one especially that one He's like dropping with his cape and he's doing like the classic superhero landing, but set in this post-apocalyptic world, which kind of gave me some um, Old Man Logan vibes, kind of these um, different groups come up. We don't really see any of them, but they all have crazy names like the organ some things like they probably steal people's organs right. and everything. Um, but the world it sets up, even though it's not like here's a map of everywhere and all the crazy things, it definitely... Uh, already feels rich and speaking of map things there is there's actually one at the end too um but th the feeling i got from this too was uh i mentioned fallout new vegas uh, for sure yeah. um has a very strong feeling of that but this wasteland i think it's in is this in nevada or new mexico i, I think it's in nevada but... yeah it's it's um southwest for sure it's not it's close to vegas right? yeah it, it's within some kind of range of vegas um, but I mean, let's see. And yeah. I can attest, Andy really did like this a lot. Like, he read it <laughs> and right away was like, I like this so much. I read an advanced copy of it. Mm -hmm. So I, I've read it also yeah. and I, I enjoyed it. I, I thought it was awesome. I, I'm a big fan of Jeff John's character writing. I feel like he always manages you to make you care about the character on a deeper level other than they've got, you know, I'm going to be the strongest or whatever. We were talking about it earlier. I mean, it's not a spoiler to say this one guy's mission is to make sure that his family is okay. Yeah. Like, that is his one goal. He's not going out trying to hunt people down or anything. He's not Liam Neeson <clears throat> taking it. He's, you know, just guarding this one spot. His conflict comes when people come to him. Yeah. And they want his land and his everything. Then he kind of turns on the heat. Right. Um, kind of uh, figuratively and uh, literally <laughs> turns on the heat. Um, but this is, I mean, 
I would say post-apocalyptic superhero would probably be post-apocalyptic vigilante, um, something along there. But I highly recommend this. Um, I feel like this is Jeff Johns at his like A game. Like when people talk about how good of a writer he is, and and I would also say get this from your shop as soon as you can because it's already sold out on the distribution level. Yeah. I read the advanced copy. I thought I ordered a lot. Like, I upped what I was originally mm -hmm. going to order because I read it and I liked it so much. And I could already say, now I wish I had ordered even more. Yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, the, we just talked about um, on our comics from the future show, there's already a second print yep. coming out and everything. Like, they, it seems like they kind of knew this was going to be big. Um, but I did want to show off some of the variant covers because they do uh, show you a little bit more of the idea of it. So, first off, we have the Eric Larson variant, <coughs> which, as we've been noting in uh, other shows, it really feels like Image is fleshing out their pseudo-superhero line with um, Radiant Black. Now we have Geiger. We have, um, let's see what, just stuff with, like, crossover yeah. that's really... Noctera. Noctera. Um, there is a a ad in the back of this for a new book from Pete Tomasi, which is also very um, superhero looking. Uh, let's see. Then we've got, I mean, one of the best covers. I, know, I couldn't pick which cover I like the best. Yeah. I, this is all... the Jason Fabok cover, which, of course, worked with uh, Jeff Johns on Three Jokers and uh, his uh, Dark Side War story arc in Justice League. I mean, you see that it's it's such a great cover, but Geiger almost comes across as like possibly a villain. The way, yeah, because it's so spooky looking. I mean, also it just it looks like it actually glows. Yeah, like I was looking at it flipping through the box, and I was like, "Is this a glow in the dark cover?" No, it just like catches the light. Yeah. Um, of course, then we have the blank sketch variant. Have an artist draw a like, glowy skull on there. Then we have. Uh, this actually had no real incentives. There was no, like, 1 in 25, 1 in 50, or anything. Uh, the only thing it had was a one-per-store variant that is a uh, a black and white of the main cover. And for our customers, we're selling this for 50. I think that's a great get. I, I have a lot of hopes for this series. I think um, the stuff it teases, there's kind of a... Uh, in this post-apocalyptic world, this kind of kingdom that has risen up with some pretty colorful characters, and it's one of those things where, like, oh, I want to see how our main character deals with some of this stuff. So, really cool. I, I definitely would recommend picking Geiger up this week. So the first one I'm going to go over is Batman 107. I actually read an advanced copy of this a while ago. In fact, I've read 108 at this point <laughs> as well. And I have to say, uh, post-Joker world war post Joker war hard to wrap my mouth around that James Tynion his writing has just continued to just excel it's, yeah. it's really good I, I, I highly recommend 107 108 maybe even better I can't wait to talk about 108 in a few shows but 107 there is a first cameo of a new character it's already been talked about people have already seen pictures of her her name is The Gardener. Mm -hmm. uh, not much is known about her. You just get a little of her in this. But she has some sort of plant powers. Mm -hmm. Hard to tell what they are. Yeah. So, you know, a, a lot of thinking is that Poison Ivy, you know, is she really a villain anymore? Mm -hmm. She's kind of an antihero. So maybe this new character is going to come in and fill the void. Uh, for some re reason, this new character, The Gardener, uh, and she's got great style, by the way. Wait till you see how she dresses. <laughs> Uh, she's got some really cool pets that aren't exactly mammals, even though they're shaped like mammals. <laughs> You'll have to see that as well. But she's interested in Harley Quinn. So Harley Quinn is back in Gotham. Mm -hmm. You see this in her own book, too. I think DC's doing a really good job of having their books mesh yeah. right now. Uh, a lot to do with um, A-Day, which happened in Arkham yeah. and all that. So Harley is back in Gotham trying to make up for what happened during the Joker War and her history. For some reason, this new character, the Gardener, is particularly interested in her. But this is going on in the Batman series, not just in her. Mm -hmm. So you see this is sort of a, an overarching yeah. thing. Uh, this issue has more Scarecrow, who has turned uh, legitimately scary himself. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't need to give you a toxin now to be scared of Scarecrow. It has more Simon Saint, 
What is he up to? How is this all lean into future state? You can see as they keep taking steps towards future state. And I like future state more than ever now because I know where it's all going. And it's so fun to watch how it gets there. Yeah. Um, so It'll be I, interesting I, to see, does it divert from that path and we get kind of an alternate future? Or is this literally going to the possible death of Bruce Wayne and all of that? Yeah, yeah. So the last thing is, there's a group called the Unsanity Collective. I think people have been talking about this a lot mm -hmm. in all the comic channels, in particular Miracle Molly. Her first cameo is not in this. It was actually in the previous issue, 106. So the Unsanity Collective, they're not in this much, but they are in it a teeny bit at the end because someone is trying to infiltrate them. Mm. And it's, it's a character <laughs> that has been on a Batman sort of character from a long time ago who I find very amusing. Mm -hmm. Anytime uh, a group needs to be infiltrated, you'll just have to wait and see. You'll, you'll see. It's sort of last panel. You get the name, and some of you are going to go, oh, I know what this yeah. is. And others are going to go, wait, is that? Who, who is that exactly? I know it's a shame you can't also talk about uh, 108. <laughs> Because where that goes is really interesting. I, I skim through it too, and it's like, oh, this is not just a little thing. Like, this is really expound upon. Yeah, if anybody has fallen off of Batman after the Joker War, or you're just behind, it's time to get back in. Yeah. I mean, this stuff, it's been really, really cool, really fun. A lot of neat new characters. Tynion has decided instead of just, hey, let's rehash the old Batman stuff, let's build sort of a new universe, mm -hmm. and let's update... Rather than let's take old characters and update them, let's bring in new characters that already are updated. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's very cool. Here is Batman 107, the Matina variant. There are some incentives as well. We are sold out of them, so we're not going to show, but just want to let you know that. I feel like Batman is a series right now you could talk about. We could do an entire hour-long show speculating what's going to happen and... You know, with all of these new villains and new characters coming up, what do the old ones think about that? You know, what, uh, you know, Scarecrow kind of got his, uh, his reforming, but there was a hint that, like, he was presumed dead. And, and what does that mean for this character? And there's a lot going on. Like, this is a deep book. The day may come that we'll have to do a spoiler show. Um, <laughs> we just don't have the time. I mean, we literally are just comics nonstop. Yeah. But uh, you, 108 does show you were right in guessing who Peacekeeper 01 is. Okay. That's revealed in 108. Cool. So. Okay. He made an off-camera guess to me. So. <laughs> we and, do that a lot. And, we make a lot of... No, we, we, have, we have Batman 107, so if anybody needs more yeah. of it, we do have it. Yeah, so what's we, up next? We've learned to order up on Batman mm. because we keep thinking like, okay, that's as many people as going to be getting it. They, everyone who's got it is happy and they're going to be getting it. And every week is like, I need Batman now. It, it'll stop. Just like with Joker War, Tynion sets up the chessboard. He gets all of his pieces, mm -hmm. you know, the pawns, and then he adds a knight, he adds a bishop, a rook. But then once they're all there, he stops and, and they all interact. Yeah. And, you know, that that's the trajectory he's on right now with uh, 106, 107, and 108. So. I'm interested to see what's the what's the end game of these characters that he's just now created. Very interesting. Okay, I read a DC book as well, and this is really cool. So this is Green Lantern number one. Uh, a lot of the books, like Batman, they continued the same numbering and everything, but with Green Lantern, they decided it would be best to start it at a new number one, which I think is really smart. Um, we had Grant Morrison's The Green Lantern going on. It actually just ended shortly before this, but it was kind of its own thing. It, it stood alone. It was two volumes, um, not super heavy into any kind of continuity. Uh, but this is back to the Green Lanterns that you know the uh, the, the storylines and everything that you may have missed um, since uh, Green Hal Jordan the Green Lantern and Green Lanterns ended a few years ago, which are both great series. This is more back in that line where um, we have our main characters in this who are uh, John Stewart, but also uh, Kelly, who is the teen teen lantern, teen lantern yeah. who has previously been in Young Justice. Um, we do find out she's 11 in this, which I think it seems very dangerous uh, for an 11-year-old to be wielding this power. Yeah, the gauntlet. 
but she doesn't have a ring. Like you said, she has a gauntlet. Um, if you're a longtime Green Lantern reader, they know that there is a, uh, the kind of prototype ring was a gauntlet. And that's addressed in this. Is this the original um, uh, Krona's gauntlet? Is this something new? Um, I feel like that's a really interesting part in this story is all this stuff with Teen Lantern. I didn't know how I'd feel about it because you think you got this kind of sassy teenager coming here telling Jon Stewart and uh, Kilowog and everybody <laughs> what's for and this is this is the new way of doing things. But I find her character very interesting and with has a lot of um, bigger implications, especially with the words like omniverse thrown around, mm -hmm. which is really big. Uh, if you read Infinite Frontier, we kind of know that the DC Universe is now a, a omniverse made of multiple multiverses. Um, so there was a lot more like big story in this than I thought there would be. Um, but it's, it's really cool. There's... Uh, now that the universe is kind of um, coming together, they're creating this United Planets um, group that uh, initially the Green Lanterns are like, cool, we'll be the police. Right. And then they say, actually, you're not here. We're not voting on that. We're actually voting if we even want you yep. in our United Planets government system, whatever. Uh, which kind of catches the Green Lanterns off guard. And I really like that idea of... They were kind of... Uh, Green Lanterns often overstep their bounds. Yeah. And... Make, you, make assumptions. Make assumptions and everything. Around. And now that the planets are kind of unified, they're like, no, we're going to decide for you. So there's a lot of interesting stuff that comes along with that. Um, Sinestro makes an appearance. You can imagine what his vote is. Apparently, he's not a fan of the Green Lanterns. Um, <laughs> Since when? <laughs> yeah, it's just like that. Oh, who invited him to this party? And so he comes there. I don't like them. When you have a permanent sunburn, you're just not <laughs> a good disposition. Uh, but overall, I really like this. Um, it kind of leaves off with a cliffhanger. Um, seems like they're really building up this this new status quo of the Lanterns. Um, a lot of your favorite ones make appearances. I don't know. If there's a lantern, that, a main lantern that doesn't appear in some form um, in this or is mentioned. But I feel like if you have been missing Green Lantern, which I have. Green Lantern was kind of what got me into reading comics was with Blackest Night and everything. So I have a very soft spot for Green Lanterns. This is a really um, good jumping on point for... You don't need to know a whole lot of backstory. This feels like a really good, like, we're moving forward with all of our Lantern characters. There's a fairly major death yes. at the end of the issue, too, that turns into a cliffhanger, yeah. I'll also mention. Yeah, that's, uh, it, it'll be cool to see what, what comes of that, too, because, like I said, the new status of all the Lanterns and everything, you know, what... Are they now, are they going to be their own police force? Is there something bigger? Um, really interesting stuff. And we have this really nice Brian Hitch variant with Jon Stewart on the cover, which I love that Jon Stewart is now kind of a de facto leader of the Lantern. Like, he, he has had his leadership position, but he seems to be more in... Uh, He's dealing with, like, the Lantern Lantern stuff, and then Hal is kind of doing, like, the Justice League right. Lantern stuff. Yeah. So you get a lot of Jon Stewart in this, and it, it's great, him and Kilowog. So really cool Green Lantern number one. So the next thing we're going to go over, King in Black number five. That's right, the major Marvel event. It all leads to this, the final issue. One of the first things I read today, I will admit... <laughs> I got in here and, and right away picked it up and, and read through it. And the first thing I'll tell you, and I'll remind everyone later on, is Venom 34 is also out the same day. I read King in Black first because I couldn't wait. Then I read Venom 34, and you should do it in the reverse order for <laughs> sure. You should read Venom 34 first. It explains something that just kind of happens all of a sudden mm -hmm. in King and Black 5. It, that makes sense. It's it's nothing that when it happened I was angry or anything. So do as you say, not as you do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if you go reach it for that King and Black 5, just hit your hand. Go for the Venom 34 first. I'll get to that later. King and Black number 5, does Donny Cates uh, land a good ending? I would say yes, absolutely. It was thrilling. 
you know, I don't think it's a spoiler to say that Null doesn't, you know, take over the universe. I mean, how would it end with him yeah. taking over the universe? So it's very much a comeuppance issue. It's very much a here is this villain that has been built up uh, brilliantly. Mm -hmm. One of the best new villains in the Marvel Universe in, in ages. And he has done a lot of evil things, particularly to Eddie Brock. Mm -hmm. Well, I, without telling you what happens, there's just a lot of comeuppance. There's a lot of parts, a lot of moments where I was cheering to see him mm -hmm. finally get uh, what he deserves. Mm -hmm. Now, how does it happen? You're just going to have to read it. Let's just say a new super awesome weapon is forged. I, I can't say more than that. So we all know the last episode, the last issue, the Enigma Force, the, the force of light, the opposite force of... Null had was coming to Earth and it was going to ch chose its protector. Mm -hmm. The protector is chosen right at the beginning of this one. In fact, you might want to read Venom 34 first <laughs> to find out a little bit more before you go into King and Black. So the protector is chosen. The, prote the protector is really awesome. I think you guys will like it. I did. As far as how him and Null fight, it's not one of these things where it happens off panel. You get to see it. It is brutal. Uh, Null really gets what he deserves. That's the best way I can put it. it, it it's, it's cool. The ending is awesome as well. You get to find out what happens with Dylan. You get to find out sort of the final fate of Eddie by the end of this. You will know the final fate of Eddie. And you'll be salivating to read Venom number 200 after this. That's what I'd say. Yeah, just skimming through it, knowing how this ends... It's kind of like, okay, this will be really interesting to see how they play this. It's, it's, it's a very big, um, at least if you're a fan of Venom, a very big thing that happens. And it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in the future now that we know Donny Cates is leaving Venom. This is an interesting um, thread that's like, who's going to pick this up? Where is this going to end up? I think... People will read it and be really excited to see what comes of this. Yeah, it, it, the ending is satisfying. A lot of people were wondering, you know, is this a big, this Enigma Force? You know, who's it gonna, um, who's it gonna enter? Is there just gonna be like something out of nowhere that saves the day? You know, because that's the endings I don't like. Something out of nowhere. So sure, the Enigma Force kind of comes out of nowhere, but that's not really it. That that helps, but there is much more. There is much more to how can Null be defeated, mm. that you will read and you'll go, this has been set up, and this is true to the characters. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was a very satisfying ending. And let's see, we got some... I like what you mentioned, too, with, uh, without spoiling it, a thing that has happened um, that definitely, for long-time Donny Cates readers, with all of his books and everything... There's kind of a payoff too to a uh, the characters and stuff that he's used over time. This kind of feels like a big culmination of those. For sure, yeah. He doesn't forget any of his people. I mean, <laughs> the, the characters he's he's added to, written on, written about, except maybe the Inhumans. They they weren't really yeah, much no. a part of this. Okay, so the variants we've got the Beaterman tattoo variant. Can't so once wait. again, this yeah. So when you get to finish your sleeve, I'm we're, see we're that. throwing down the gauntlet. Who's get, who's been getting all these tattoos? I mean, it's the last one. Come on, you might as well do it. Here is the Stegman variant. I'm gonna miss all this great Stegman. I know. I really hope Venom he, and... he has a, a job somewhere doing something awesome. Yeah. And here is the Booth variant. I believe that one is a wraparound. Let's let's take a look. Remove the yeah. So here's the back. Just showing a little bit of all the different heroes who are involved in this. I would say King in Black is the best Marvel event in the last ten years. Mm -hmm. that, that's my opinion. I, I, it was... Definitely the most well crafted and and earned. Yeah. You know, it doesn't feel like oh suddenly. You know, if Null just showed up in a spaceship and started blasting people yeah. and stuff, it's like, it, then he'd just be one of those generic villains. But that it feels like we've been with this story so long, 
it's cool that it actually has this finale. I, I am no way I'm saying it replaces Infinity Gauntlet as my favorite <laughs> Marvel event. Infinity Gauntlet's my favorite Marvel mm -hmm. event. But this was just so awesome. Yeah. So awesome. Um, before we continue, I forgot. Back to Batman. Batman 106 has a second print that is coming out. The first print sold out because it had a cameo appearance of Miracle Molly. Mm-hmm. And so just want to let people know to look for this one. Who knows how many stores have ordered it, so it might be a good pickup. I grabbed some. And it's a great cover. Yeah, indeed. Cool. So on to my Marvel book. Um, this is America Chavez Made in the USA number two. So I would be lying if I said I knew everything about this character. This this character definitely was came I don't think out. Her writers knew everything about. I her. know that's kind of why the series exists. Um, you know, I read some of her and and uh, Young Avengers and just kind of when she pops up here and there. Ultimates I did really enjoy um, the Ultimates with her in it, uh, but I really appreciate the series because it is kind of for people like me who are like I recognize the character, but I don't know a lot about her. Like a lot of her backstory which saying a lot is very minimal, took place in like Young Avengers uh, kind of later on in the series. Um, so I seeing this is, is really cool that they kind of lay it out for you. There's still a lot of mysteries in this about um, where she's from, when she arrived on Earth, uh, her family that adopted her. Um, but uh, at, in this story, there is a mysterious character in the last issue has basically been like sending her threatening messages and all this stuff of like I know who you are I know where you're from you better guard yourself and your family um, so in this you can imagine she is pretty upset about that uh, this has great uh, guest stars spider-man's in it um, Kate Bishop Hawkeye is in it which is really cool to see her because I haven't read anything with her in, in a while yeah um, but I'll say the little bit we we uh, we learn, this person who has been um, sending her messages and everything, the vibe I got for sure was one that this is a new character, mm. and they have very strong ties to America, and maybe even a family member of her like true family that. Uh, we know if you know her history that her parents kind of had to sacrifice themselves to get her through the dimensions into ours to save her. Um, but this one definitely gave me the vibes of, okay, this this person knows her on a, a more personal basis, which I think is really important because she doesn't necessarily have a huge cast that's her own. And this could this series could definitely be setting up um, some of her key players in her life that we'll see going forward, especially as Marvel is using her a lot more. I'd assume if somebody's sending America Chavez threatening things, they would have to also have superpowers because she's one of the last people you want to stalk. Uh, you know, yeah. Some, some superpowered. I, that's person. the other thing too. So when she finally catches up to him, um, there's you know, a chase where there's some powers thrown around okay. uh, from both sides. So that's what also gives me the feeling of like, oh, this this person is pretty familiar and may be from the same place or related or something. Um, but we also have this awesome bangle cover. Really, really nice variant for that one as well. I like she's in front of her own logo a little bit, like her foot's in front of it. <laughs> yeah. Well. Okay, so I'm going to talk about Silver Coin, the new horror anthology series from Image. I believe this is a four-part series. I don't think this is ongoing. So I know a lot of people are thinking it sort of channels Ice Cream Man. I've been reading Ice Cream Man since the beginning. I'm <laughs> You're big, the ice cream expert. Yeah, I'm a point. big horror fan. And so I was really excited to read this. I actually read a while back another one that they gave us an early early copy of. In fact, they, they gave us the first three, which was really nice. So they're way ahead. Don't, don't be afraid that this series <laughs> is going to be delayed. They got the first three done. I know it. 
So each one is going to be done by a different comic writer. This one's by Chip Zdarsky, mm -hmm. who has done so many cool things, it's, it's hard to list them all. Uh, so what I would say about this versus Ice Cream Man, Ice Cream Man is a little more direct horror, in my opinion. This was more atmospheric. For instance, so this one is set in the 70s, and it follows a rock band that's getting pushed out of their venue because disco is on the rise, and they don't <laughs> want to play disco. That is horrifying. <laughs> yeah, so to tell you the truth, this has as much to do with trying to be in a band in that era mm -hmm. and trying to make it as it does with horror. Hmm. So the, 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 the common thread of each of these is a silver coin, and if you find it, it's going to do good things for you, but like Monkey Paul style, it's also going to be ruinous ultimately. Mm -hmm. So if you like stuff like that, you're probably going to like this. But it really did lean heavy into more about the band and about... Uh, one of one member in particular, just sort of family life, and you know changes they make, and infighting with the band, and the silver coin is there, but you, you it doesn't like manipulate them. I feel like mm -hmm. if this was Ice Cream Man, the silver coin would be like all through it mm -hmm. instead of just sort of a little part of it, you know, the thing that just sort of tips it later in. So I think that's the best way I can put silver coin. Um, is it supernatural? For sure. Okay. Yeah. So it's it, not just like the coin is our camera and it's going to no. bounce between people. And... No, the coin makes things happen. And at the end of the first issue, the coin is found by somebody else. The second issue doesn't necessarily follow that, though. It's just sort of the coin is going to be where it is. Mm -hmm. uh, you can tell it has a, a long history. You can even tell in this issue that somebody had it before our character gets mm -hmm. it. Um, and that person sort of, there's a mystery as to mm. whatever happened to them. So that's the best thing, that, that's the best way I could talk about Silver Coin. And, you know, Zadarsky, he writes a lot of comics with humor in them. He does not channel that in this one. This is mm. not a funny comic. Uh, it's just, it feels like drama horror is mm. how I would put it. Period piece drama horror. And by period piece, I mean the 70s in this one. Yeah. So... It has two variants. Here is the Latoy variant, which I think this one, it shows how when you're you're rocking out, you almost look like, like a zombie. Your, your body's <laughs> like in positions it wouldn't normally be in. I don't know if that's what they were going for, but... And this is the Huen variant. That promises a lot of horror. <laughs> yeah, this one is more horrifying than possibly the entire issue. The issue was scary, but... That's a really scary, yeah. frightening cover. Yeah. So. And Ice Cream Man is also just disturbing. And I feel like maybe that one's not quite as like uncomfortable as yeah. Ice Cream Man can get. Yeah. So. This was like watching something scary. Ice Cream Man, like some of those issues scare me as I read them. <laughs> so. <laughs> but it's cool that uh, a lot of companies are embracing this like anthology style storytelling where... If you didn't like this one, you might like the next one, right. or, you know, that I like them too, that they have like the through line and everything like Ice Cream Man does. Yep. So next up, this is a interesting one that's going to take a lot of, a lot of talking about, uh, but this is Tankers number one. This is the new book from Bad Idea, the, uh, the new company that brought you ENIAC, mm -hmm. which uh, ENIAC number two also came out today. Yep. Um, so this one, just to to uh, preface it by saying, you know, this is very limited quantities. This is, uh, we, we still want to talk about it, yep. but it's not like one that was open order that we can offer everybody. So uh, this is pretty much for our customers and everything. Um, you can check and see if your store was on the bad idea list. Maybe they got some in too. But I think this one is really interesting because, I don't know, ENIAC, I, I feel like we've been following the saga of this bad idea company. Yeah, what a and saga. <laughs> what a saga that has been years in the making at this point. Um, and ENIAC was kind of their their test their their you know they they throw this one out there and just let's just see how people react to this new way of doing comics which is um very uh limited release 
and very um, rule heavy with like, you know, we couldn't sell it um, on eBay for a certain amount of time. We couldn't sell it, you know, outside of our store. And only, um, what, 200 stores in the whole world were allowed to carry it at first. Yeah. It's been a wild ride. Yeah. I mean, sometime we need to, like, sit down and do a little documentary on, on the what journey of like Bad Idea, be. what it was like to be a store, like, all this, all these, because uh, that started, I mean, pre, year before pre, last, pre-pandemic, pre yeah. where we at least knew about it and were working mm -hmm. on getting it. Well, this is cool because this is the next book out from them. So this one is a three issue series called Tankers. And the what the tankers are are these kind of mech suits um, that the pilot these specialized pilots drive. Um, and the the story is it in the future, I don't think there it gives a particular time, oil reserves on the planet are running out. They basically say we have like fifty years left of oil. Um, it's, you know, and that's like a rough estimate. They're like, it could be even sooner than that. We completely run out. Um, so what's the best way to get more oil? I feel like they figured out the most convoluted way of getting more oil. Yeah, they just wanted to fight dinosaurs, but go on. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, they decide since fossil fuel comes from uh, like decaying dinosaurs, um, they would have a lot more oil if the dinosaurs died later. So, they, I, I liken this, they have time travel, and the people are like, this would take forever to develop, and the guy's like, actually, we already did it. And I, I just think that's funny, it's like, we don't have to get into the nitpicky of, like, it's, yeah. we get time travel, it's, it's done, here. let's move the plot Yeah, along. it's like, that is not the story here. So, their idea is they're going to go back in time, uh, to the time where the asteroid uh, hit Earth and uh, killed all the dinosaurs, and they're going to shoot the asteroid and deflect it off the Earth, and basically buy them like 50 million more years before the asteroid comes back around. They're like, okay, at that point, it can hit, kill all the dinosaurs, and we'll be good. Um, so, but to do that, uh, it's going to be very dangerous to go back in that time, so they hire these elite special forces uh, who drive these tankers to go clear the area so they can move the scientists in and, and the giant cannon that's going to shoot the asteroid. Uh, it's just, it sounds crazy and it reads kind of even crazier. This feels like a very, like in the 80s, if they had a really big budget, something they might try to pull off. Um, I will say in this, I uh, was rooting for the dinosaurs. The humans in this are kind of terrible people. They are all very uh, just power hungry. Everybody in this is very power hungry. The oil companies, the uh, the people driving the tankers, they're like doing this because they're going to get a big paycheck and they're going to get kind of a, a bonus of whatever they wish. But of course, as you can imagine in this, this mission does not go well. But... Uh, it is very violent with robot on dinosaur uh, action, which is really cool. Like, it, we feel like we don't see that a whole lot. Um, I really liked it. I felt like it was a very readable. It's written by Robert Vendetti, uh, who's had a long run on Green Lantern, Exo Man of War. Uh, he, he's done some really, really good stuff. Uh, Hawk, he just ended his run on Hawkman not that long ago. Um, but he's a great writer, and this, it was crazy, and I felt like the real achievement was stuff like the time travel and all that was like, they didn't explain it, and I was like, that's fine. Like, I wasn't right. constantly being like, no, wait a minute, why did you do that? It completely just, uh, you know, they, they kind of skim over it, but you're so interested in the end point that you're like, I kind of don't, I also don't care about how that we got to this point. Um, so really cool like i said three issues long um i think this is now i have not read ENIAC yet but i feel like this one uh, people are, are really gonna dig just because of the kind of the craziness the all-out action um i really enjoyed this and since this was my first bad idea book that i read i have a lot of high hopes for their uh their kind of the production quality and everything of books coming out. Like we were talking about before, 
um, with ENIAC and with this. Like if the paper stock they're using is great. Just yeah, the, quality the quality of the, of the book is really, really, really good. Um, so yeah, that is Tankers number one. Yeah, Andy told me the spoiler review earlier <laughs> when he was reading it, and uh, it sounded really, really wild. And you know, hmm, time travel and will, will that blow up in your face with the implications of what you did? Hmm, that never happens. Yeah, it, it's like. It's kind of that like really bad action movie logic of like, I think this will work. I think by shooting this asteroid and preventing dinosaurs from dying, then we'll be good. It's, it sounds like they're going to pay for it at least. Oh, so. yeah. And I'm, I'm rooting for the dinosaurs in this. <laughs> okay. So I read The Next Batman Second Son. This is a four-part series. It's all about Tim Fox's origin. You know, Tim Fox is the next Batman. Mm -hmm. No spoiler there anymore. That's been out for a long time. He now calls himself Jace, which I have to say is still not revealed in this. I think we're going to find out where he came up with calling himself Jace. Um, but this box, uh, this book goes into his origin. It starts out with him. And he's sort of a, a military man who is taking out evil billionaires across the world hmm. like just these evil sort of uh, billionaires who run countries into the ground and so he's a special forces guy and that's that kind of explains some of his batman yeah. training and you know his family can't know all the ins and outs of what he does and so that's why they don't really know mm -hmm. he's doing that they know he's away they know he's in the military but they don't know what sort of level he has risen to um well he gets a visit from grifter who brings him back to gotham mm -hmm because his father, Lucius Fox, needs to talk to him about something important. And at this point, Lucius Fox is pretty much the richest guy in Gotham because he has all of Bruce Wayne's money mm -hmm. from the Joker War. Uh, they go into that a little bit, which is interesting. They, they actually talk to Lucius about what's it like having all this money now, and he has some really interesting thoughts on that. So what you do find out in this issue, without spoiling the read, is something happened with tim fox that he is very guilty about and it is something that had legal repercussions mm. i i don't know what it is yet so me telling you this it's not revealed yet <laughs> it's going to be revealed one of the other issues he feels guilty he's run from it he has decided to make himself a better person so he has that guilt you know batman he has the death of his family mm. it seems like the uh the sort of kernel of what um turns him into more than just a regular you know, guy, somebody mm -hmm. who could be a Batman is whatever this guilt is. His father has called him back for a legal deposition and he's trying to sweep it all under the rug with all this money. And Tim doesn't really want it that way. He wants to pay for whatever this is. So I really want to know what he did, mm -hmm. why he did it, why he calls himself Jace now. Uh, I have to say, I've enjoyed everything with Grifter in the DC universe so far. <laughs> I'll say that. I, I never knew I liked Grifter until they started bringing him back. He's a really cool interesting character yeah uh he he's sort of uh if you turn the volume up to 10 he's like an 11 yeah all the time without being like as goofy as deadpool mm -hmm. I, I like deadpool but grifter's a little more um real real world so um meanwhile while this is happening this is before future state luke fox is still batwing at this point mm -hmm. which is interesting because in future state you know he had given that up and you could tell he was sort of against people doing that. Now. And we kind of all thought like, oh, next Batman, that's that would, would be him. Luke Fox. So yeah. we're going to get to see, yeah, what, what makes him leave being uh, Batwing. So we, we, we will see that. So it's got one variant, the Lashley variant, which is really cool. Is it is it action -y book or is it is there much bat? anything it, in it it begins it begins very actiony because you know they're in not or not yeah i think it starts in vietnam the country yeah not, not the war um so right away you can see how he deals with things mm -hmm. but no it's a lot more about his family life what whatever this legal thing is what's going on in his head so that that's more what it's about it's it's good that you know DC hasn't forgotten about next Batman. It's mm -hmm. like you're going to be next Batman, so we got to kind of show how did this happen. And I liked reading Future State Next Batman, but my one criticism was 
it was too short. Yeah. What? What? And so now they're starting to fill in all those gaps. They're left too much of a mystery, and that's what this is doing. So that's the book. I like. Uh, I also like the idea because it. I was thinking like, oh, this takes place in the past. Well, it takes place in the past of Future State, yeah. which is like kind of current in current continuity. It's like, oh, when you said Joker, I'm like, oh, it takes place. Well, that was that was recent. That's, yeah, that's funny. And this also explains why. Here in the DC world, you know, he got called back, but nobody really knows it. He's yeah. not like going out in the town or anything. Mm -hmm. He's just there to take care of his business and his family stuff. So, let's see. Next up, I have another uh, DC book. It is Crime Syndicate number two. So this is a six issue mini series. Uh, not a ton to say about this, especially if you read the first one. You kind of know. Uh, what what you're getting in to this one um you're dealing with the earth three uh crime syndicate which are the evil version of the justice league um but it's really fun to see how a group like an evil justice league even manages to like <laughs> stay a group stay a group and you see in this they kind of don't they're kind of also punching each other along with with the villains but uh what i what i really like about this is uh it's not a spoiler in the first one the kind of big bad in this is Starro, which uh, if you saw the uh, recent Suicide Squad movie trailer, we know that Starro is coming to the Suicide Squad movie. I think it's cool that we're seeing a bit more of him in this as well. Um, character I really like. Um, there's also, this is a hard thing because I'm not sure if their first appearances or not, but there is kind of a group shot of a lot more Earth 3 characters. So I know we've had books like Multiversity. They even had a guidebook that basically is like, these are all the yeah. the characters in Earth 3. So these characters could have appeared there. Um, but this is also kind of a rebooted Earth 3. So there were some characters I recognized in this, this shot, but also some that I didn't. Um, I always like to see like, oh, what's this version, this universe's version of Martian Manhunter? What's this universe's version of... Um, Oh, what was one of the other ones? You know, because the main one you've got the Flash, which is Johnny Quick. You have all that, but in the in in one part you see a lot more, and I think that's really cool. Um, kind of fleshes that world out a little bit. Also, this has a backup story where the first one had the origin of Ultraman um, by Brian Hitch. This one has the origin of Owlman, and it's a new origin of Owlman. We've had the origin of Owlman a couple of times before, but since death metal and kind of the multiverse being recreated um these are new kind of augmented versions of origin so i think that's really cool in this too kind of a new definitive um, origin of each of the characters uh per issue so really cool if you like number one i'm sure you'll like number two it's a lot of fun um just seeing a bunch of bad guys also be bad to each other uh, and there's this really awesome variant. This is the Tyler Kirkham variant of Owlman. Yeah, that Owlman variant's nice. So cool. And you find out what, what's different between him and Batman quite a bit. Um, a lot similar, but just... He went a different direction when he got scorned. So, <laughs> pretty cool. Alright, so Venom number 34 is also out this week. If you missed what I said during King and Black, please read this one before you read <laughs> King and Black number five. It'll make King and Black number five make more sense and a lot more enjoyable. So Venom number 34. Eddie Brock was killed in, what was it, King and Black number two? Yep. And since then, the only part of him that's alive is in Null's Hive. He is a codex, which is basically like a memory. Mm-hmm. And so you're just in the hive. He's been in there for a few issues. He's run into some familiar people like Flash Thompson, who's also pretty much anyone who's ever been a, um, joined with the symbiote is in this hive. And they're trying to find their way out. And so Null is also in here. It's not the real Null. It's just sort of mm -hmm. a portion of him. The real him is on the outside world. So this is them trying to find, is there a way back? Is, is there a way that they can escape this? And I can't really tell you what happens. It would spoil the read. But um, read this before King and Black, number five. That's the main thing I can tell you. It also has something that happens at the ending that's pretty important. 
outside of King and Black. Mm -hmm. So it's not just like a filler one. Mm -hmm. With the ending, it's like, oh, this is going to have implications that might um, end up affecting even other titles like Spider-Man and such. Okay, I was about to say, it's it's funny because when you're saying, oh, this has everybody who's been part of a symbiote or whatever, it's like, that place is chock full of the Marvel Universe <laughs> with all of those characters. Well, it, it's when they die, I think that's okay. where, where it is. Interesting. And that, that's, they were collecting all the codexes, yeah. building up the King in Black. He was having Carnage collect them. Yeah. And, man, so much when, the, if, when I think back to what all started the King in Black stuff, it's so, so much stuff. Yeah. And it's also cool because if you miss some of it, it's still fun to jump in and read. It, mm -hmm. It's not, you know. So we got a few variants here. We have, oh yeah, and this is also the second to last issue that Cates and Stegman will be on. So Venom 35, which is also being called Venom 200, that's the legacy numbering, that is going to be the next one. There's been a delay on it, though. It's actually not coming out for two months. Yeah, the big gap yeah. between these two issues. They've at least announced the delay. So, here is Venom 34, the Stegman variant. Might as well hold it up to... Oh, yeah, that, that's <laughs> Make it. them fly whichever way you want. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Correct. I love this kind of... Uh, since Kate and Stegman have been on there, like this new kind of form that Venom has taken with like he gets these bat wings. It's a really cool kind of uh, uh, evolution of the character. Yeah. And here is the super log Venom Thing cover. <laughs> so Venom cross with Man Thing. They've been doing all the crossing with Man Thing covers. So I love that one. I love the well. creepy mouth in his stomach. That's so cool. <laughs> so next, I'm going to actually do a double feature because these are, are slightly related. So we have Star Wars High Republic number four. There's so many good comics out this week. I know. This is a big week. You see my piles of comics over here. And Star Wars High Republic Adventures number three. So let me move this real quick so I can put these next to each other. Um, this series, I mean, you know, we've said it over and over. Star Wars is back and hotter than ever. I think everyone knows that at this point. It's kind of redundant to say it. But... Uh, what really got me about these is how closely they're all kind of tied in together. So I finished reading the, the novel that was kind of kicked off the High Republic. I'm reading the next one, which is a young reader book. Characters that are in, like this young reader book, are in Star Wars High Republic. Um, you know, it, it really feels like they are building a whole new universe because it's set so um separate from the prequels and the sequels trilogy and everything we have all these new characters we're still learning a lot about them and uh i feel like these two issues do a lot to further the um the overall story of the high republic so with uh high republic number four we're kind of wrapping up our first story arc um it may have one one or two more issues in it but we're kind of getting some answers to stuff that that's been going on since the first issue but a really interesting note i wanted to say in this one is there's kind of a so we've had this um this plant-based alien life form thing kind of uh, uh manipulating some characters and everything we kind of find out their origins in this, but in their origins, they do one of those classic comic book scenes that has the, like the branches go out and we show like the history of this thing. Um, as a Star Wars fan, anytime you show me like history of things, I'm like trying to pick stuff out. That actually references some Sith or Dark Jedi that are pre High Republic, mm -hmm. which since the Disney uh, Star Wars buyout, we really haven't got anything older than High Republic. Right. So we haven't seen, you know, they've alluded to like the Great Sith War and all of that stuff, but we actually see some um, history of this, this life form, this plant alien creature, and it doesn't flat out call them Sith or Dark Jedi, but they've got red lightsabers. Um, I think that's really cool because it 
especially because they have a very distinct look that I have not seen before. They have very like distinct masks. Hmm. Anything like that, if you know Star Wars, is a big deal. Like stuff like that is not just thrown out there. So we even get some before High Republic hints at this. And, you know, I could be just picking this scene apart more than it's supposed to. <laughs> but for Star Wars fans, that's a really big deal. Uh, but other than that, great issue. Um, just such cool characters they've uh, they've built up for this new timeline. And then Star Wars Adventures, for one, this is uh, has a cover appearance by uh, Marchion Rowe. Yep. Up there you see with his helmet and everything. Not first cover appearance because there's actually been some variants store variants yeah, and stuff that have happened um, but for like main series um you know a covers a and b covers or whatever this is his, his first appearance um but with this uh you get a lot of really interesting parallels with the jedi and the nile which are our new big bad group um because there's been these two friends that have split up and one has uh, continued on the Jedi and one of them has went to the Nile. And there's a lot of really interesting side-by-side -side panels, pages that show kind of what is similar about them and what's distinct about them. Um, but definitely, a, I feel like a very world-building issue where you see a lot about the Nile and a lot of visual stuff we haven't seen before with those characters. So... Really cool two issues. Um, other thing, there is a new villain group, I would say, at the end of High Republic. I believe it's High Republic or 4. It's hard to keep them straight when you read both of them. <laughs> um, that is, it, it's a crime syndicate. Um, but definitely have a, a another distinct style. And if you're a fan of the Star Wars kind of crime underground, You'll definitely want to see this because there's there's some really interesting characters in that. Um, what's also really unique about this issue of High Republic, this is the first time we've actually gotten a B cover, a a you know same price, um, not incentive, um, not store exclusive variant cover. This is the Bustos variant, and uh, I think it's really cool. I hope that we get variant like just give us variants for every issue it's fine yeah. we, we all want them so really cool bustos variant then we have the uh high republic number four the one in 25 u variant that has one of our new jedi on it We're selling that to our customers for 30 really cool and then uh high republic adventures had a uh, retailer incentive variant that we are selling for 25 but uh, you can see it, it's it was hard in the beginning when this came out and I was really trying to convince people like High Republic Adventures is not a kids book right it focuses more on like Padawans and younger characters but it is, still has as much impact as the main one does but uh, you can see on that and we are uh, selling this for 25 And yeah, the fact they put March and Rose first appearance in the Adventures book shows that they're not really favoring one over the yeah, other. Yeah, I think that's like. a good way of putting it. They're not favoring. One's not getting all the good stuff, and the right. other one gets the, the cast off. It's like, no, these are all equally important if you want to read the full story of this, this new era in Star Wars. So the plant the plant villains, they're mm -hmm. like, what, the Drenagir? The Dren yeah, Dren gear, D R E N G I. I'm waiting to find out that the plant from Little Shop of Horrors is related to them. That's oh, yeah. what I want to say. It'll be in the background somewhere. <laughs> the will be making him some uh, new form of him. And it's like, mm -hmm. oh, hey. Okay, so from new from Boom Studios is Magic the Gathering. Magic has not had a comic in some time, and this is an ongoing series with new characters. So if you want to catch first appearances, there are several in this. And Magic has been optioned by Netflix. It's going to have a show. It just seems like this property has been around for so long, a few people at the top are like, why are we, why are we not doing more with yeah. this? I mean, this is a known thing. It has a built-in audience. So Boom's going to try it in comic form. 
This takes place mostly in Ravnica. Mm -hmm. Now, I played a lot of Magic back in the 90s. I played it when it started. I got away from it a long time back. Um, you know, a lot of my friends mm -hmm. keep playing it. So Ravnica, I don't know a lot of the magic lore, but apparently Ravnica is this amazing city. Uh, in fact, the beginning of this comic is almost a love letter to it. When mm. you read it, you'll see what I mean. And there are these guild masters who are also planeswalkers. It means they can go between the different worlds of magic. And someone tries to assassinate one of them. And a lot of this book is them getting together and building sort of a team who's going to look into this these assassinations, this is a team of these guild masters who normally wouldn't team up. Mm. And you do get to see some of the villains. It's not, I don't think the major villain shows in this. It's more like a lackey just showing their power. Um, I know one of the major characters in Magic, I see, I'm seeing him, I see him on cards and he's <laughs> been in other things as this character, Jace Bellerin, I believe mm -hmm. is his last name. He makes an appearance in this is book. Is he the fire guy? He didn't do any fire okay. in this one, but maybe. I know a Less about magic than you, which... <laughs> but uh, Jace is a powerful character, and even he seems at a disadvantage against these new villains. So, I, I read the book, and this is coming from somebody, I don't know the magic lore at all, I don't know the cards past 1998, maybe. Mm -hmm. And so it's a little bit of a learning curve. There were definitely terms and phrases and people in it. I was like, I don't really know this. But it's still being written by Justin Jordan, so he tells a good story, mm -hmm. and it's it, the art of it was fantastic. I'll say that. The art in Magic the Gathering is top-notch. Boom, I think, is making sure about that yeah. for all their stuff lately. So that is sort of my, my review for the new Magic book. So if I was to come into it being like, I have never heard of this thing called Magic. Right. How... But I've read fantasy books. How easy would it be for me to read it and and get kind of the idea of going on i i think the issue is sort of half and half i think half of it is like hey hey everyone you know magic this is cool and we're going to show you this place and this person mm -hmm. and you know how this works and look they're using that spell and they're talking about a counter you know how that works but then the other half of the book is sort of you don't need to know all that stuff you know, this is a, a real plot line, and you'll kind of start understanding it as it goes. You'll understand the world, and it, it lets you uh, be fascinated with exploring all these new ideas. And Does anyone tap lands? No, no no lands are tapped. Oh, man. <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to see what a physical or a, a picture representation of someone... Do they literally take the earth and shift it around, or do they walk up and they tap on the ground? Maybe issue number two. I, I'm, I'm waiting for that uh, so there, first land tap. There's several variants to this. The, the variants I'm going to show you, this is, they did sealed bagged variants called the Planeswalker variants. I believe that there are four different ones, and you don't know what you're going to get until you open up the bag. I think it may represent sort of the main characters in the series. So this is just it bagged. I did not open it to, to show everyone. Then there is a blank variant, which they, they went with purple. Purple is not one of the five colors in Magic, but I have heard people say that purple is like jokingly the sixth color. Uh -huh. uh, you know, if they were going to do another color. Yeah. Purple. There are some incentive books that we got for this. For $20, here is the Guerra variant. This is a 1 in 25, showing one of our characters. Then there is the 1 in 50 Yoon variant for 30 bucks. This is more what the, the battles in there look like. Definitely magic flying. And here is the 1 per store variant we're selling for $40. Great uh, Matteo Scalera cover art yeah. for that. Really nice. Yeah, they're, 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 you know, this isn't just a cash grab. They are trying to build this property yeah. up. They're trying to do it justice. Uh, will it find its audience or will it build a new audience? Let's say, to be fair, the, there has been some cash grabby magic comics in the past where, like, people are like, this our is... Do our dollar bin has something yes, in it. Um, but I think it's, especially Boom, Boom has so much respect now of, like, you put out quality stuff. Yeah. Like, I, you haven't put out, like, not every book is for me, but I can definitely see the quality of each book they put out and how much work, and um, they don't let just anything through. 
And so that's why I'm like, I kind of want to check this one out because I feel like they would also have people like me in mind who haven't, aren't super versed in the lore, just know the, the overarching I'll I'll things. be interested to hear your take after yeah, you read it. Yeah, because I'm, I'm going to read it. I want to see. So let's see. Next up, we have issue two of Suicide Squad. This is the new, um, the new Suicide Squad series that just started, um, but also it kind of I feel like this really represents a kind of a new rebirth of the the whole idea of Suicide Squad and everything. Um, it's funny because there's been so many Suicide Squad series that they're like, no one is safe and all this stuff and you're like okay yeah and then you read it and you're like well, i can clearly see who you're gonna kill off yeah, right yeah, away no, nobody's head gets blown off except for one guy at the beginning to yeah. scare you then yeah yeah i feel like this is not that i think they're gonna be killing off like major major characters but that they have characters in here that last longer than i imagine they would and some characters that I thought would last longer that don't. So I think that is that is the key to a good Suicide Squad book, is kind of this, no one's safe, we're kind of constantly moving, constantly, uh, just right on the edge of something going wrong. Um, but this is cool because this kind of introduces a new second Suicide Squad team. Um, so which, you showed me that. Yeah. yeah. You were showing me, you're like, who are these people? Yeah, because... I didn't remember them from the first issue, and uh, of course, maybe not all of them make it through there. I mean, it's not when you introduce a bunch of new characters in a Suicide Squad book. I mean, so, some have to be fodder, but that's, yeah, that's fun. But what I think is really interesting is there's some that do make it and get some character development and everything that you go, oh, okay, maybe this is actually going to be a new interesting character. But along with those new characters, there's also, um, as you can see on the cover, Talon. Um, uh, who, I mean, from back in the Court of the Owls storyline and all of right. that, um, that's a pretty significant now member of the uh, the Bat mythos. Um, you have Connor Kent Superboy, which is yeah. very interesting. It, you think, how do you... How would you control him? How do you control him, him? At all. And, you know, all of them have, like, this little bomb placed in them that could go off if the... Uh, the people who are running them so choose. How do you get that into somebody who has um, skin of steel? Right. You probably just hit them even harder with the needle, which is horrifying. Mm. But you you kind of you get a lot of explanation for that. Um, some really interesting character stuff. Of course, there's kind of some big reveals, surprises, and everything. Um, this new there's also this new character you can see on the cover down in the corner next to the barcode. That is Noc Nocturna. I, now that I see that, it's like, I try not to say Noctera. <laughs> I think it's Nocturna. But it kind of gives her brief, like, character description and everything. But, I mean, she made it on two of the covers this week. So I'm like, okay, maybe we got a new character right, here. Correct. Um, I, I really liked reading number one also. I, I wanted to read number two, but Andy grabbed it from me. <laughs> it's, it's, I don't know. If it's written well, if Suicide Squad is written well, it is a fun book right. because it's chaos. Yep. It's these characters that they're very uh, they're gray. They're very gray characters, and they have to usually perform a, a really difficult mission under duress. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And the other thing I want to mention about this, um, the whole thing with A Day. I'm yep. not sure if we're spoiling A Day yet. Um, this big thing that happens in Gotham. Um, this is going on during that. Yeah. Like, you literally see what happens, and it affects some of our characters in this. Uh, other than Infinite Frontier Zero, this is pretty much the only book that shows you yeah. some of what's happening during A-Day. Yeah, and I forgot which book it was in that Batman was mentioned that he showed up, but they were like, they immediately tried to like run him out, and he was like, I'm just, I was just trying to save people. That was mentioned in like a different book, and you see that scene in here where Batman comes uh, to Arkham and and yeah. is trying to save people. Like it's really so interconnected, but also not um, 
you know, you don't feel like you're missing out. It just kind of makes it a little bit more fun. And, and that that cover is a very A Day cover. Too, I know. Too, so when you know what A Day is, <laughs> we'll we'll spoil it in a week or so. Yeah. Um, and then here we go. Here's the variant that has that new character on it, along with Superboy and Talon. So they're really beefing up this team to be something something really cool. I'm excited to see what they what they do with all of these characters and where the series is going. Okay, so real quick, I'd like to mention that Swamp Thing number two is out. This is the new Maxi series. It's a 12 issue series. I, th I believe, right? No, I'm sorry, it is a 10, 10 issue series. Because it's a weird it's number. It's a near Maxi series <laughs> uh, with a new Swamp Thing. First time there's been a new Swamp Thing in quite some time that has their own 10 issue series already. His name is Levi Kamai. He is an Indian. I guess superhero. He, he, he hasn't been doing a lot of heroing yet in the book, but uh, you know he he's seems new to being a Swamp Thing. Um, I know he's one of DC's first uh, superheroes who's from India, mm -hmm. and in the first issue he was kind of dealing with being a Swamp Thing. He meets another monster who kind of has been a monster for a long time. Who tells him, "Oh, I, I see you're a monster, but you're you're new to this. Let me show you how what it's like being a monster." The monster and, ropes. <laughs> yeah, what, what's good and what's bad, and it was hard to tell if that character was going to be good or bad in this. So Swamp Thing number two goes further into that. I was reading so many things before this, I actually did not get to fully read this one. Yeah, I'm going to read it later. I just flipped through it, but wanted to make sure everybody knew this was out. It has a variant cover we're already sold out of by Matina. Really nice, mm -hmm. uh, all black. You can barely see Swamp Thing. He's a little glowing green in the <laughs> center of it. So sorry we don't have to sh that to show you. We, we sold out of it. But there you have it. Cool. And lastly, just go over these pretty fast, uh, these last few books. But uh, Amazing Spider-Man 63 came out. You can see Spider-Man's new suit is on there. Uh, and this is the beginning of a new story arc, King's Ransom. I think this is actually... A little bit oversized um, of an issue uh, it has a little bit more it deals a lot with kind of uh, the supporting spider-man characters of course uh, kingpin is in it uh, really cool I mean made spider-man has been so good lately with the uh, last rights uh, or uh, last remains and all that so really cool and it has this really nice Variant. This is the 1 in 25 design variant where you get a really good look at that new suit and kind of what it does where the mouthpiece kind of pops up and everything. But we are selling that to our customers for 30 and that's a 1 in 25. Okay, I also read Avengers number 44. A lot of stuff has led up to this issue. This is the finale of the tournament that the Phoenix has been holding with all the heroes to determine who is the new Phoenix. I can go ahead and tell you there is a new Phoenix for sure. Like 100%. It doesn't end with, none of you deserve the power. <laughs> there is a new character who has never been Phoenix, you know, other than through this, who does win the tournament and is going to stay the Phoenix. So I would, you know, those of you who want to get first, um, in, in not first appearances, but first this as Phoenix, yeah. you may want to grab that. It's also just a really cool issue. I mean, there are several of them left. They're all fighting for the power. Some want it. Some just don't want others to have it. Mm. And others just don't think they need it at all. Like that's actually suggested. Like, why do we want the Phoenix yeah. to be a part of one of us? So pretty cool issue. And I will also say that if you guys like the Phoenix Force, if you like the Phoenix Force, there is more Phoenix Fire panel for panel in this comic than I've seen in any comic. I mean, every panel, it's the like book Phoenix is Fire, on Phoenix fire. fire. Yeah, it's it's incredible. If, if you hear me say that, then you read it, you, you won't be able to, you probably wouldn't have missed it anyway, but just every panel is like <laughs> Phoenix Fire, Phoenix Fire, Phoenix Fire. But I'm really glad that they resolved it. I'm glad it has a what I would consider a true ending, not mm -hmm. like a pulled punch, not like a, a bait and switch. This is going to continue on. In fact, I got to read a preview of Avengers 45. Funny enough, before they didn't give me a preview of this one, <laughs> they didn't want me to know, but they gave me a preview of 45 where I actually found out who won in that because yeah. it, it is mentioned. And it's continuing on. So with this person having to learn their new powers and all that. I'm being careful with the pronouns here uh, to reveal nothing. 
There's also more revealed about the whole thing with Phoenix possibly being Thor's mother. Yeah, that's a thing. People, I've had people come into the store and be like, is this a thing? Is there, are they doing this? It, like, it is oh. a thing. So what I would say is more is revealed about it, but it is not resolved. I, I will say that. More is revealed, but it's not like, okay, it's a done deal, the end. It, it, it leaves, there's more questions. Mm. So Avengers 44, let me show you two variants. They've been doing all the characters with the Force in them. Here is the Weaver. The Weaver variant. Cool. And then we also have Love the this one. Momoko variant with She-Hulk with the Phoenix Force. Like, like she needs more power. Yeah. <laughs> OP. Yeah. All right. Awesome. I think there's also a connecting variant for that, too. Oh, we might not have we, that. We might have been yeah. sold out of that. Um, I didn't see it in the But box. those are cool that they've been doing those. Mm -hmm. uh, next up is Sensational Wonder Woman number two. So this is uh, one of those series that every issue is kind of a different story, um, all centered around Wonder Woman and what makes her sensational, what makes her awesome. Um, this one's really cool because it is uh, centered on War World with the Mongol, and Wonder Woman has to uh, go up against Artemis, who we know from uh, Red Hood and the Outlaws fame. But a uh, really cool issue, great art. Um, the uh, the artist by Bruno Redondo, and there's some there's some great scenes in that. And then there is the really cool Sway variant with Wonder Woman and Artemis. Okay, so I read Noctera two a little while ago. You read that a while ago, because you gave me your review on that yeah, yeah. weeks ago. I really, really, really like this issue. The, the number one Noctera, I was like, I like the style, I like the art, I like the setting, but I need more. You know, the, the plot was good, but I, want, I wish it had been a double issue. This solidifies it. This was really, really, really cool. The villain in this is really scary and awesome. He's the shadow guy, which, of course, makes sense for this world. This is a post-apocalyptic future where something happens, which this issue goes into what it might have been. Mm -hmm. It goes into it pretty specifically. Something happens where sort of darkness overtakes the world. There's no more sunlight. The sun is gone. And if you don't stay in some sort of artificial light within so long, within so many minutes, you get infected and you turn into like this evil creature. You know, and I, I remember when I read the first one, I'm like, okay, well, is this a zombie thing? Is this, it's not, it's, it's something different. It's mm -hmm. something I've not heard in a lot of things. It is explained, at least an explanation is offered in this <laughs> issue. It's not, I, I think it's going to be for real. I think it's going to be the one. This Tony Daniels cover to me, it sums up a lot of what I liked about the book. Just strong characters, strong designs, good art. I mean, just looking at this, it's like, I want to know what's going on here. I think her rig is really cool. The mm -hmm. fact that she transports people um, between uh, safe safe places, mm -hmm. but everywhere she goes in between is very dangerous. I mean, this world is probably one of the most dangerous worlds I've read about since Walking Dead, mm -hmm. where you're like, this is so dangerous. I don't know how anyone will survive and how, you know, you'd be scared so much. Would you even <laughs> want to survive? Yeah. Um, the main the main character. Let me talk about her. Her name is Val. She, she people call her Sun Dog. That is her uh, her trucker title. You know, they, <laughs> her call sign. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because she she trucks people around. She has her little brother with her who who helps her out. And this goes into her history. It goes into what what were you doing when you were a kid? What what were your parents doing the day the lights went out? Mm. It goes into sort of how her parents handled how they tried to kind of shield the kids from some of the reality. And it goes into her adult thoughts on this, uh, not that she's much older now, and how she kind of disagrees with what they mm. did and and sort of is handling it different for her and her brother. So a lot of, um, a lot of personal stuff in this mm. story. Meanwhile, tons of great action, a villain that is super scary, who goes after them, he wants the people carrying he offers her a terrible choice he <laughs> offers her like you do this or this will happen 
and she has to make her choice. By the end of the issue, she does make the choice. They don't string you along. Uh, a lot happens in the issue. If you were on the fence about number one, definitely pick up number two. If you miss number one, I think we might still have some of it. And it had Come a second in and check printing it out. too. Yeah, yeah I, I'm real down with Noctera. That and Geiger, two new really awesome series yeah. going on. So um, I hope somehow they can cross over <laughs> in crossover. Well, he would, uh, Geiger uh, would be great in that because he would glow. I, exactly. And he could like walk through Except the darkness. Except that he would give you cancer if you got close Yeah, close so to you just let him walk in front of the truck a little ways. Okay, and there's two variants. Here is the Kirkham variant. We got her with her, uh, her cool like yeah, yeah, her... forehead light there and her flares. And then we have the Clayton Henry variant. Awesome. Um, so I did want to mention this real quick. This is the second printing for Peach Momoko's Demon Days, uh, her written and drawn and everything book. Um, one of the hottest books of the year. And it's really cool for this second printing that they actually did a new cover. Um, when I first saw this, I was like, oh, I thought this was issue number two. But no, this is uh, the second printing of the first one. So if you're a big Peach Momoko fan, or you love that first issue, or you missed the first issue, um, you'll definitely want to pick this one up, because another great uh, cover entry. Okay, so I finally read ENIAC. <laughs> Number one and number two, I just read that today. It came out today. So um, on this show, whether or not you're getting the comic or have the ability to get it, because I know not every store has this, and very few were chosen, um, we, we like to talk about the big books. We just like to review them anyway and tell you about them. ENIAC is a top-notch book. Mm -hmm. That is what I will say about it first thing. It feels like uh, it, it's very uh, cinematic, there isn't like one major character. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of characters and you care about all of them. Matt Kent is that sort of writer. He can do that. He can make it where, oh, there's a character. I mean, there are some characters as a group. They're in it for like maybe one page, but they're so cool. <laughs> I'm like, this is awesome. These are not throwaway people. Uh, they did their purpose, but the story must move on. It all surrounds this villainous AI computer called ENIAC who I like it when a book can have a villain that is so large in the life that everything surrounds that villain, mm -hmm. yet you don't really get to meet him or know him. It makes him scarier. Like, yeah. why is this computer doing this? What is its end goal? What is its aim? All we know is that it has extreme power. Nobody can get to it. Um, it's, it's smarter than, than us. It can predict people. It can predict humans really well. It's been around since you know, mm -hmm. so long and it's upgraded itself. So it's really cool because ENIAC jumps around in time. You get to see back when they invented it, you get to meet the inventor, you get to see what it did back then. And then you get, of course, the present where it is sort of holding the world hostage and it has started a countdown timer of three days <laughs> till it launches all the nukes wherever it wants to go. Um, so it's almost an impossible mission. And so instead of Kent having it where it's just like, you know, one or two people are dealing with this. It's a lot of people. We do finally meet two people that are specifically brought in to handle this who might have a bigger part in the ongoing issues. Um, but I, I just really enjoyed the read. I've been a Matt Kent fan for a very long yeah. time, and I think he put extra into this. I would be shocked if somebody doesn't option this. Mm -hmm. This just screams interesting movie or TV show. Um, so if you're one of the people who has this on our pull list, you know you're going to get it. Um, obviously, it's very limited quantities, but we covered everybody who mm -hmm. ordered it from us. So I just wanted to let everybody know, you know my opinion on it. I think it's a really awesome series. It's also fairly adult. Um, it has like little bits of nudity, but the nudity actually isn't like comedy nor sex. <laughs> nor, nor sex. There's like a, a casual. Purpose. I mean, what happens when a supercomputer can see and hear you anywhere? How yeah. can you ever feel secure? Mm -hmm. uh, that'll be my hint about that part. So um, some real, real creative stuff going on in ENIAC. Cool. And I think I only have one thing left to show off, which is really nice. This is for Marauders number 19. 
This is the David Finch cover. David Finch has been doing a lot of really, really nice covers yeah, lately. Great. Had a really awesome Silver Surfer cover, and now we uh, have this really nice Kitty Pride with Lockheed variant that we are selling here for 35 Really cool. Okay, I just have two things to show. There is a Beast Wars number three in Senate out this week. It's a 1 in 10 Perez. And we are offering it for $25 to our customers. I grew up watching Transformers and then later Transformers Beast Wars. So I know. I've had multiple gotta, people gotta come in and be like, I didn't watch uh, Beast Wars. I really enjoy hearing you and Jason talk about how much you like Beast Wars. It's good. And it's rewatchable. I watched it, it, I guess, like maybe about five or six years ago. I found it on YouTube and I rewatched it. And I was like, this is great. Yeah. Uh, initially, you're like, oh, the graphics don't hold up. But then suddenly the story kicks in. You're the like, story oh, this is, story is yeah, great. Don't tune in for the graphics. <laughs> no, 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 it's no, like no. a PlayStation 1 cutscene. <laughs> yeah. So the last book we have to talk about, we'd be remiss if we did not. Berserker, number one, second print, the foil print is out but they allocated every store in the country so don't get mad if you cannot get your hands on this book we are already sold out of it this is my personal copy which i wanted too and i only get one to begin <laughs> with but that's how it goes um why boom is doing all the allocations i'm not sure um it, it, it kind of sucks because people want all of it. Berserker was a great read. It's really cool. It's got a lot of people interested in comics who weren't as interested in mm -hmm. them before. Um, so just want to show it off, make you aware. If you have a way to get a hold of this, I would. If you ordered this, if you ordered this from us, you are getting it. Mm -hmm. we, we were allocated just enough to, ca to uh, cover our people, basically. But just wanted to make sure to, to bring it up. We, we try to bring up all the major books. Um, and if we don't bring up a book, it, it's not that we don't care about it. It's just there's only so many to talk about in yeah. the show. I mean, look how long this show's been already. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's important we talk about that Berserker. We've mentioned it on Comics from the Future when they yeah. put out the third printing that already they said is like limited, limited to, to 10,000 10, copies. copies, which in the grand scheme of things is not a lot of that, copies. That is tiny for how popular it is. I mean, there's probably 3,000 comic stores in the world. So let's say every store tried to get 10 copies. Well, every store would get between three and four copies. Yeah. So that's a very small amount. Yeah. So that's a little bit behind the scenes of uh, your comic book store, just like us, can't necessarily control everything. No. We get what we get. You know, you can ask for more all you want, but it just, you know, when they tell us this is all we have, then we've just got to roll with it and make our decisions. But yeah, I uh, mean, I mean, as a joke, when we know we're getting allocated, we'll put a big number down. Like for Berserker number one third print, they they announce only ten thousand copies available. We put five hundred down. That's that's five percent. Like if twenty stores did that number, that would be all that they had. <laughs> We put that number down because, you know, it's it's sort of a joke. It's sort of like, come on, boom, do more. Yeah. And so when it arrives, it's going to show that line item, 500. Nope, got allocated down to four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'd be like the, the biggest allocation. And yeah. I think a lot of stores are trying to pull that too. And, you know, we'll see what we get. We don't even, we won't really know until like right before it comes in how many we'll have anyways. Yeah, so. we, we mentioned on Comics from the Future, our Friday show, that we're actually just letting people put their names in a hat mm -hmm. to get it. And whatever number we get, we're going to draw that many names out of the hat and we're going to sell it at cover price to them. Yeah. And that's it. So the best we can do is make a promotion of it. So we just wanted to bring it up, let people know, mm -hmm. you know, we, we try to make this a formative show. And so now you better understand and hopefully it saves a lot of comic shop owners from having to explain <laughs> it over and over again. But thankfully, you can still get a first print of number one yes. easily. You can get the foil. We'll, get, we'll sell you 10 first prints we of number one if you like. We would love to sell you 10 copies of number one first print. <laughs> never, never touched as far as we know. So, All right. Well, that's that it. is our show for this week, which, wow, big, big week big in week. comics. Which is good, you know. I mean, there'll be the light weeks here and there. Mm -hmm. We need we need the great big weeks with yeah. stuff to read. I mean, I spent like last night reading, much of the day reading, and you still have books that you went over that I need to take home tonight <laughs> yeah. and read more. So, but that's that's the fun of comics. Uh, thank you for joining us. Whether you join us on Facebook Live or on our YouTube channel, thank you. We are uh, heading towards seven hundred fifty subscribers. Mm -hmm. 
on our path to a thousand on YouTube. So let's keep that train going. Yes, tell a friend mm -hmm. and have them tell two, like a, <laughs> like a pyramid scheme. <laughs> there you go, yeah. All right, well, thank you. And uh, we'll be back on Friday with comics from the future. Yes. So make sure to tune in then. And have a great day. Go read some comics.